whole world knows that we're live. Yep. Well, Bonnie's not going to let you buy the jetpack, Brian. You just got to do what anybody else will do. You know, <laughs> well, get a warehouse. Get your own shed on property. Yeah. Oh, what I have to do is responsibly buy some scuba gear and just mm -hmm. aim properly as I open up the hose. <laughs> Andrew, yes. you might know this. I was talking about this on DTNS yesterday. Did we ever find out the Tony Stark Iron Man guy that was flying around LAX during... No, um, I have a theory. I literally saw something come up the other day in a feed about that, and we could talk about that because um, I have a theory. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we were doing uh, – there was something on the after show yesterday about uh, Guinness Book of World Records, and so uh, we were looking up other tech Guinness Book of World Records, and there was something with, like, a jetpack, and I was like, does anybody remember the – like so much stuff happens in our modern world that the the things that that get memory hold are more electric than ever. <laughs> like things that we know that we all remember and it's just like, oh yeah, and then we were talking about the Haktua girl. Like like we just kind of didn't have room in our brain for the guy flying around in a jetpack at LAX. It's like, we didn't have a follow-up? Really? I have to watch a million different uh, 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 five-part Netflix series about every home invasion in America? We can't do anything on the guy flying around LAX? Yeah. Yeah. All right, we ready? That's up to this gentleman. Yep. Yeah. This brave yeah. warrior. Okay, here we go. I'll count you in. In. Oh, another one. You're going to make me get a bamboo. Yeah, you're going to. I'm going to get a bamboo that makes another bamboo. And eventually, just, it's going to be paper clips all the way down. All right, here we go. Ready? In three, two, one, and. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Maine, joined by the very weird Brian Brushwood. Hello, I'm pretty weird. Whoops, so weird that I look like Justin Robert Young. <laughs> and uh, that's the other weirdo here, Justin Robert Young. <laughs> Sup, fam? Let's not make it political. <laughs> I forget. <laughs> Come on, guys. Come I got on. news. We got a broad audience. We got a broad audience. Let's let's I'm keep it above. Saying, all right. All politics is weird. Yeah. I don't think anybody, any any party wants to be throwing the weird label at anybody. Else. I know. I know. Uh, so, uh, anyhow, uh, we were just talking about right before the show, and literally, this was something I was thinking about. I'm really glad you brought it up because I, I saw an image of this a while ago, back around. Right around 2020 and then 2022, there were some, there was 2020, 2021, 2022. There were sporadic sightings of somewhere around California, what has been described as Jet Pac Man. Yes. And specifically, this got national attention because pilots that were both departing and arriving to LAX saw this person and uh, the, the the news story as i read it yesterday reread it yesterday was it, it was something that was under investigation by the fbi yeah and the fbi yeah uh looking into this to try to figure out like hey what's going on so we had multiple sightings i'm actually going to send uh brian some uh an image of from property mechanics of what this looks like and there was a case earlier of like 2020 where it turned out to maybe be like a Jack Skellington balloon, but there seemed to have been other examples of what people thought were, you know, somebody flying around on something. And so um, now, now when you say Brian, flying around on something, are, are you talking about like, like a crazy surfboard? Like, like he's the, uh, uh, the, the, the Brian, the, Brian, is he called surfboard man? No, he's <laughs> called jetpack man, which is technically more rocketeer than iron man. Please go ahead. <laughs> yes. Okay. I've sent video. I have Brian. I sent you a video at the bottom of the article. You'll see video of this. This is listen, this could be faked mm -hmm. entirely possibly faked. But we know the technology. Scroll down. There's actually a YouTube video of this. Okay, here we go. Jetpack right. man spot. Did that? Okay. 
Ah. Yeah, I just wait. I'm sorry. That was not Surfboard Man. No. Okay, the Jetpack Man has been like a staple of 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 TV since like 1970 something. This is off the coast of Palos Verdes in December of 2020, and you see that there's a man in the sky flying around. This is from the uh, Sling Pilot Academy. Yeah, imagine being that student, getting your flight test, yeah, and you see some dude flying around in a jetpack. You're like, is this, do I say that I see this? Like, like, like all right, what am I? So, Maine, the hell is happening here? It's obviously some rich person that is flying around Los Angeles, but is this available tech? Like, like what is what is going on based on your opinion? Okay, well, let's unpack a couple of our assumptions there. Yeah. So, let let's say let's accept for this sake of argument, we'll accept that the video is real. We'll say, yes. that, yep, this is a credible video. Looks convincing. We saw a guy in very, very far away, but looked in an upright manner wearing a large backpack apparatus. Okay. Yeah. There are companies that sell jetpack stuff. Now, one of the limitations on them is flight range, right? And so this guy was in uh, Palos Verde, which is, you know, very, very south part of Los Angeles off the coast. They said near, you know, Catalina. Uh, I don't, you know, I'd like to know more about the position of which way we're looking because it, it did look like he was closer to Catalina Island, et cetera, like that. So, uh, I'll give you a hypothesis, uh, which is private companies testing this, private companies built this, and there's all kinds of crazy government funding. I, I find out, I, I, I think that I know the limits of what's possible, like government research and what, you know, the defense industries funded. And then I find new things all the time and crazy expensive things and stuff like this. So, you know, hypothesis A is, you know, this is some you know more long-range jetpack maybe being tested by a company uh reason we never heard anything come out of it because maybe they were working on a government contract or something to try to build a thing you know it's like my my theory is that yeah it's probably somebody working on something maybe on contract for the government to develop a long-range jetpack well and, because, and it's it's the right? range is the thing right because um yeah like here, according to this documentary footage from the Fall Guy season two, episode one, scene seven, uh, we've had the ability to <laughs> to use jetpacks for a long time. <laughs> uh, the uh, uh, oh, it's not gonna get to it. Where's the jetpack? There we go. So uh, there are basically they're just giant um, uh, canisters of gas, and you get about what thirty seconds of flight time as it blasts you up. And but but if if they are able to run an engine, like that's that's a real jetpack from the nineteen seventies, but you yeah. run out of fuel real fast. So we've now so I found an article, and this was from. Uh, uh, basically talking about there's a, a DARPA program, DARPA, which is the thing, you know, the or agency that funds a lot of this stuff. They have a program uh, in fact, 2021 called the Portable Personal Air Mobility System, PPAMS. And basically what it was is they wanted to have, be able to fly to low to medium altitudes and range up to five kilometers according to the solicitation for prototypes. So there was, the government was putting on solicitation for prototypes to say, hey, we're looking at this. And apparently they were assessing five, prototype flight kits from five different companies under phase two. So basically, and we know the names of these companies, Skypad, Morse Corp, Triton Systems, Cornerstone Research, and Lintec. So they were giving, you know, million dollar contracts to develop this. So uh, I think it's what we saw. <laughs> I think we and saw. So, so we, hey, we just, we hey, just assume and, that somebody got a little out of pocket, maybe flew a little bit closer to LAX than they should have. And well, I don't. They were these were planes on a flight path to LAX. So basically, these okay. were planes going into LAX. So, so yeah, possibly so. But I would say that you know, my what's my money? Yeah, it was one of these companies, one of these five companies developing the thing because it's military tech. They're not going to put out a press release and say what we've done. We saw that that thing looked bigger, and you know, basically building longer, you know, more powerful systems and. Um, also like, Hey, 
some parts of government still work. <laughs> yeah, at least we get jetpacks, or somebody's getting a jetpack at some point. Yeah. I don't know who's going to actually get it, but eventually it'll make its way to the private sector. Yeah, well, I think that here, uh, for military uses, if you want to put in a commando force, a group of SEALs, you want to put in, you know, uh, DevGrew or one of these sort of, you know, advanced tactical units, if you want to get them, basically, if they're saying a five kilometer range, which means that you can basically helicopter them in to a, from a safe distance and send these people in sort of single file or whatever, like very, very fast, very quickly move them across the area. But having being so low to the ground and you're not going to hear it like it'll probably make a loud whining noise, but you're not going to have the same target as a helicopter. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, you know, technology for G.I. Joe. I would say, I mean, certainly. I mean, like that dude that we saw in the video, I'm assuming he was flying over water, but that, that yeah, d d you know, that, that demonstrates a tremendous faith in, in the tech. Right. If you're yeah. if you're flying yeah, at that height without any apparatus around you and, and you're going over water like that means that you are pretty dang sure that you are getting back to the shore. Yeah, and I have a feeling what probably happened is one of the companies testing this and then there was probably like, hey, guys, uh, we need you to not do that out here. <laughs> you know, we need to the part of it being a military project is the idea of maybe secrecy. So. Yeah, and so they go out to Palos Verdes, and uh, then all of a sudden the the student uh, the student pilot catches them. Well, I think that's probably what maybe that was why we haven't seen them anymore. Was yeah. that that was the there was a video, and now now you you got to uh, you got to you got to be out of pocket. All right, yeah. well well we will keep our uh, our ears to the ground. Jet Jet Pac Man, real. How myth, about how about instead we keep our eyes to the sky? Instead of our ears to the ground, I think that's that's if we're gonna see them, <laughs> we should be looking up. No, no, not we're physically keeping looking our ears, up, which is to metaphorically oh my keeping our ears. God, to the I gotta ground. show you. I've, I'm sorry. I breaking interruption. Breaking interruption. Um, wait, Brian, hold on. I'm wait, wait, no. while, while, while you figure that out, did I really just get metaphor shamed by Brian Brushwood? <laughs> is that really a thing that just happened on this show? You, you of all people, <laughs> of all people, I'm sorry, that metaphor was too opaque. <laughs> no, I was just making a I, joke. I, 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 I'm, I'm beside myself. I'm looking at one of the companies that's, that's been working on this. Uh huh. And, uh, I am speechless, speechless. Okay, uh, Brian, is, is uh, it checker? Oh, oh, got it. Ch check my email. Uh, it, it turns out it's the Mahler Sky Car. They actually did it. <laughs> you crazy sons of guns! Uh, you're not that far off. Oh, really? <laughs> well, okay. Here, let's see. Um, oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Justin, we want to describe what, what we're looking at. The but <laughs> the Sky Park is a 112 HP drone backpack that works. So, you know, of all the 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 things that I, I know, uh, Andrew, who is very uh, interested and excited in all sorts of technology and, and drone tech and flying cars and stuff like that are certainly among them. Uh, uh, I've heard from the mouth of Maine uh, uh, hey, not everything is just 50 quadcopters tied together. <laughs> well, it looks like this is basically just 50 <laughs> quadcopters tied together. There's, there's no, there's no solution that people won't say. What if we just tied 50 quadcopters together? Just, it is just a pick, backpack just, frame. It is a backpack frame with two, four, six. 12 quadcopter just, rotors. Just, just picture uh, General Grievous, but instead of lightsabers, <laughs> I have an it's your Jedi way. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, I mean, if it works, it works. We'll be the first ones to say that, but Jesus Christ, do not take your hands off the stick or lean back. Good Lord, um, no, right? <laughs> this is... This is like something I expect the dad on Malcolm in the Middle to come up with. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. But I'll tell you what. I mean, I mean I That's terrifying. It says it says it's a few years ago, an electric jetpack. Oh no, wait. This is an actual jetpack. Yeah. Uh, wait. Well, it's a flying device. It's not a jet, so but it's yeah, it's, it's driven so. 
Uh, well, would you think that that the the jetpack man that we saw main would be some kind of like fuel propulsion? Then it was time to make a large scale. Um, I think that it's a very good question to sort of figure out. Like, if if you look at the images like that, I mean, it could have been this thing. I mean, the idea that so what they're trying to do is basically use. Um, you're gonna want to use some gas. You know, you're gonna you're not gonna use battery. You're gonna want to use you know basically some sort of fuel. Oh in my God, that's so um, many that's... blades. They're in a high school gymnasium and it's just just cuisine arts. It's it's my living nightmare. Yeah. Oh, this is terrifying. This is absolutely terrifying. Like literally, just have the pilot fly through the enemy and just just tear them to <laughs> exactly, pieces. Right? <laughs> They'll surrender. They'll surrender in a day. It'll it'll be done. You know. Um, oh, I guess they I, again, are saying it, that in a in a in a finished version there would be housings for all of these. Well, thank God for that. <laughs> uh, Godspeed, Ascend Dynamics. I don't know why you would show it without it. I guess maybe you had a deadline or something. Well, you want to show that it works, and also well, you, you you lose efficiency with the shrouds. Ah, uh, so. yeah. So maybe they wouldn't be able to do what they can show here. Also, these are definitely take take a look at this shot. Uh, these are definitely black painted two by fours. Yes. yes. <laughs> well, you got to keep stuff as light as possible, right? Anyway. <laughs> that is a mannequin that I am assuming was hollowed it's, out. No, they're they're reclaimed wood. <laughs> Our reclaimed wood. Yeah. Pack. <laughs> New Pentagon requirements are really kind of crazy. <laughs> ethically sourced, made from ethically sourced wood. That's amazing. <laughs> I don't think I'd put a video out with a bunch of two by fours bolted together like that. Yeah, that. but what if you, you got a million you, dollars from the government? But you do realize, yeah, too, that like many of these contractors and these bidders are three dudes in a warehouse in Van Nuys, yeah. you know, with with a welder and some motors and looking in a Granger catalog. I mean, that's kind of awesome and terrifying. But that's literally, you know, you imagine it's like billion dollar facilities and stuff but it's literally three guys all drive pickup trucks like you know it'd be cool yeah you know oh my sister knows somebody who writes you know grants you know next thing you know boom uh well we know somebody who pays us money on patreon it's you friends head on over to patreon.com slash weird things support this show make sure we keep doing it each and every week and get our after things podcast it's all available to you Head on over there, patreon.com slash weird things. So I think that we could reasonably say, not conclusively solve, but probably pretty well, we think we have a pretty good idea what's going on there. Yeah. Um, so we're not not too, um, you know, shocked. Uh, hey, so uh, let's talk about Stonehenge. Whoa. Okay. Oh, oh. We're doing, we're doing Stonehenge tonight? I, I, like I caught... Tap? Uh, I caught a headline. I did not read the article, but the headline intrigued me. Uh, have you heard? Have you heard about this, Justin? I have not. No, I am. I am. I. Uh, I don't know what happened with the uh, with the henge. So, uh, number one, uh, Brian just illustrated. I think what's true of all of us is we just read the headline. <laughs> just... What else? Is, you, what, you what know, else is there? Hundred years from now, like you know, there used to be a thing called an article yeah like, <laughs> like what's that oh that was actually facts and body of text supporting the thing that we mm -hmm. said like oh so uh one of the things that's been interesting about stonehenge is if you look at the location of stonehenge and you start to figure out like hey where are these stones come from most of the stones you know they pretty much figured out were you know kind of came from sort of the the surrounding area but the altar stone, what they call the altar stone, one of the center stones, this at the center of it actually, a uh, I believe a geologist had determined, said, hey, he looked at the structure of this and said, this thing actually came from like Scotland. Well, uh, okay, Qu uh, quick side story. Um, <laughs> adorable moment with Bonnie. She was like, I want to go to Ireland. I want to go to Ireland so bad. Uh, 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 but, uh, but, but that's not, 
that's not where Stonehenge is. Stonehenge is over in Scotland. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and it's like, sweetie, <laughs> uh, Stonehenge is in England, and now she gets to be right. At a time, it, 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 it once upon a time, yes, that, that stone, you know, the altar stone was in Scotland. So just if she's not specific about when she wants to visit Stonehenge, yeah, yeah it's correct. Like, I want to go to visit that. Like, yeah, I think that I probably would have thought that too. Like, you think about, you know, all the cool, weird stuff maybe up in Scotland, but yeah, actually, it's, it's in southern England. Um, so you know, or the south part of it, so the Salisbury Plains, so it's actually um, west of London. And you know, but that's the interesting thing is saying, like, hey, now I'm, I'm, I'm gonna. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw water on this, but like, I, like I believe, yeah, it's probably came from Scotland. Like, ah, and like the fact that it came from, you know, what we now know is Scotland and came there. Like, man, this had to be a, you know, a vast culture. It, it's England. It's, it's like, yeah, you could probably stand on top and see, you know, where it came from. Like, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know. I mean, it's, you, we, you know, vast is you vast. Know, kind of yeah, but for them, they don't move. You know, they don't like. There, there's, there's the old joke that uh, you can in America you can fall asleep in a car that drives for five hours and you're still in the same state where in England uh, you are in a, a totally different culture and the name for the sausage roll has changed five times <laughs> yeah so and, and, and they hate wherever it was you just oh came God, from oh god do they <laughs> jeez the white guys yeah so let's see Glasgow so you know, like a few hundred miles, you know, like it's it's not it's not an inconsequential amount of time place to travel. Let me that let, let me let me walk that back before I get some very angry people sending me emails using words that to them are swear words, but to me just yeah. you know articles of clothing and other stuff I don't understand. But anyhow, um, uh, yeah, it is not inconsequential. But yeah, four hundred miles is a, it's a very big deal. So like, how did it get there? You know, what was it? Um, they seem to assume that this wasn't like some glaciation event that left, you know, a bunch of deposits there, which, you know, that would be my hypothesis. We'd be like, oh, well, maybe that we just had periods of glaciation. There might be a lot of the stones elsewhere. But if it was actually transported from there, it's a pretty big deal. You know, it is pretty impressive. Yeah. You know, there's also the pyramids. That was impressive, too. <laughs> yeah, but where did those well, stones come from? Well, I guess those, yeah, those are locally sourced. Yeah, but, no, but, that's that's the key here. The key here is like, all right, well, but when do we believe that Stonehenge was erected? Uh, well, it depends, yes. But yeah, into the pyramids, yeah, yeah, Brian, the pyramids were that big mystery, and then they found a quarry like next to it. And they're like, oh, oh, cool. But also thing too with the pyramids was that some of the po stones from that may have come from further away, but it's kind of like next to the Nile. And so you know this boated it you know yeah but, uh but also yeah you do have to think about what was the landscape like back then whatever so let's find stonehenge age and it may have been one of these things built at different periods um doot, doot, doot. 700 bc or excuse me um they built across several phases okay so let's go look at the phases right so um believe the stone was constructed in several phases from around 3100 BC to 1600 BC. So contemporaneous with, you know, some of the pyramid development. So you're looking at, you know, 5,000 years ago, and then the larger circle coming in about 2600 BC. So bonkers, man. Like, um, what, uh, like, what visionary? So, so what, what kind of, rudimentary transportation is available at that time like if we're at the top of the line i'm i'm wandering on to the whatever bc whatever lot and i'm saying give me the top of the line i got plenty of grain and uh, uh, uh I'm, I'm ready to trade like are we talking about horse and and horse and buggy or whatever yeah. i know that i know that trees were hard to come by um and so i'm, I'm not imagining a ton a of wood stuff of 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 horses drawing carriages yeah wood was hard to come by in england uh uh, uh in in the uh uh yeah i'm gonna end up messing up my my thoughts here but uh uh i know there are sections of either ireland or scotland where it's just they there there just wasn't 
a lot of structures trees. built out of uh, wood because mm. stone was so much more plentiful. Mm. Well, so you, we don't really think we have a lot of evidence of, let's say, the wheel being used there. But they would use sleds. So if you use sleds yeah. and people pulling sleds and whatnot, um, there probably would imply there would have been routes or would have been roads from the north to the south. And we can probably find those roads right now on Google Maps by looking for modern roads yeah. that were built on top of the older. Like, where are the roads, guys? I don't see any roads. I don't see any ancient roads. Well, we tend to build we're new using roads them. new roads. Yeah, they're, they are literally 10 feet below here. You know, you're going to find people. You're going to find the Roman roads. Go for it up there. So, you know, you would have paths and roads like this. But also, too, yeah, the, the landscape there, um, you know, very likely, and you could probably find a lot of stuff with thermal imaging and stuff to see how things are packed down. And, you know, it could have been, you know, a, a, a big religion. It's not an impossibility. I mean, it's literally, we could, you know, a high school could arrange the movement of one of these things a few miles a day or whatever. So, yeah. I mean, like they certainly enough. didn't have anything to do. Yeah. I mean, they'd solved all their problems, everybody. They weren't trying to feed them. <laughs> they were living in an age of abundance. Yeah. So, you know, we, we kind of, we, we, you know, we'll, you'll get this sort of thing like, ah, oh, you know, we couldn't build this thing today. Eh, we could build it today. We just build it differently, you know. But there are things that, you know, the Romans used to form a concrete that was really good, you know, yeah. that like basically their concrete was kind of like it still was sort of powdery or whatever inside of there. So when it cracked, it would like reform and whatnot. It was very useful for certain things. But it's not like, ah, oh, we should all be using Roman concrete now. Well, not necessarily, nor that we need to have ignore some of these older building technologies. Am I so, making up the, the this story? Is it a true story that uh, uh, that that they lost the recipe for concrete for a little bit? So, yes, that was basically. It was. I mean, when we say they lost the recipe, it's not like oh, we had this manual of Roman architecture, how to make concrete over here, and we forgot how to do it. But to say that, yeah, the people they're mixing that concrete, whatever, as we sh you know, you go through dark ages and whatever, and they just don't making that anymore, then yeah, periods of time when people didn't know how to make Roman concrete. Uh, today, we break it apart. We have a pretty good, you know, I'm sure we could go find some, you know, do you, you know, some engineer, you know, some, somebody who's, you know, a structural engineer, or whatever, somewhere and say, hey, can we make a version of this? Be like, yeah, give me two grad students in a year and, you know, we'll have that. But yeah, there was a period of time when we weren't using, making concrete because nobody knew how to make really concrete. Well, also the concept of like building has changed a lot from the Roman Empire to now. <laughs> there, it, it is it is a lot more democratized uh, than it than it than it once was, and so the 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 biggest issue is affordability to achieve your goal. Yeah, you know, and it, and what's crazy too is you know one of my my favorite things is uh, uh, Gobaleki Tepe. Which I'm never going to be able to pronounce correct, and uh, but that's the place in Turkey. Which that thing is twelve thousand years old, Damn. right? And that has got amazing, you know, carvings, weird stuff, uh, you know, statues with dudes with boners, and that's how you know it's real. Yeah, you know, you know um, yeah. And they had these there. They were famous for they had these T stones. So basically, there'd be stones with like a with another. Uh, stone across it forming a T. Now, of course, there could be a lot of other things that went along with this that we didn't know, like wood or other things placed on there, and we're just left looking at the stones. Like, you know, you you burn out all the wood in a building, and you're left with the concrete structure, and you're like, well, what did they do there? And so, but anyhow, that is fascinating because uh, we're closer in time to Stonehenge than Stonehenge was to when they built that. Oh, wow. Wow. So if you go take a look at, uh, I'll send you the link. Yeah, to wait, here video. I found I found an article. I I, I think it's the right one, but uh, uh, this place. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, if you go to the Wikipedia, you'll get some more articles. You can see the stuff, and the the thing that makes it really fascinating is that uh, we have a very nice theory about how uh, agriculture led to civilization, and civilization led to people building things like big stone monuments and pyramids and stuff. But this predates our understanding of when agriculture came about. So we're like, oh, wait wow. a second. You know, what are what are there? If you go to the Wikipedia for it, because you'll see some really cool images they have there. And they yeah. show some of like the stones inside of the museum. Um, and, you know, you start to think about, okay, people were like doing stuff 
really, really cool stuff for, turns out, as long as there have been people. <laughs> huh. Strange thing. So, you know, we, we're speculating on, you know, what was it? And I think that I, I yeah, welcome to the Weird Things crew try to correct historians and let's their, go and their job you want to know what they've been going for too long i think that we we often oh wow make that, one, that one almost looks like like a like a like a south american um, yeah some of them do yeah the way they do animals and stuff too that's so, fascinating yeah like that i was like yeah that very much looks like like inca or aztec so here's my theory uh we often go, oh, well, it's religious. You know, it's religious. That's why they did it, did religious. Well, religious practices are really motivated by practicalities. You know, we take something practical and then we want to keep doing it. And then we develop a religious reason to keep doing it. You know, we want to, middle of winter, you know, we want to get our spirits up, whatever. You know, we come over the holiday, we break out the really good food and we celebrate. And, you know, that becomes, you know, winter solstice, you know, because, hey, the sun's at this point, let's do that. And then that becomes Christmas or whatever kind of holidays. These things are kind of universal. You say, hey, uh, you know, you want to create a bazaar or to trade and people want to come trade because exchanging goods is really good. And, you know, maybe it's convenient too that you have a bunch of people showing up there and you have kind of a belief and you want people to adopt your beliefs, then maybe you build an altar or practice or you share it with people. And then all of a sudden, you start building churches and things like this in the places of bazaars, but then you realize we can go build a church somewhere and then we'll have a community pop up around it. So a lot of these things really were about trade, you know, encouraging trade, both well, not just well, like goods. imagine, you know, 6,000 years from now, uh, people discovering the ruins of, of Epcot, like, whoa, mm -hmm. what must this have been? And it's like a place to sell funnel cakes and t-shirts. Yeah. Or, or shopping malls. You know, you would you would look at shopping malls and you would say, OK, you know, you'd find these big food court areas. You'd look at a food court. and You probably imagine all oh, they all gathered here to listen and to speakers speak and stuff. And you're like, and all the religions were acknowledged here. The hot dog hut, Orange's Julius and <laughs> Chick-fil-A, you know, and, and you realize that like, no, we, we kind of came here to buy clothes and get food. You know, yeah. and maybe we stuck around and, and to make us attractive for us to come here, whatever. And there might have been competition stuff, too, for these things. So I think that a lot of these things were built on trade. And like I said before, it's like it's not just I want to buy some flints or some stuff. You know, uh, I want to go find out the latest technique for, you know, tying two sticks together. Like, like how many of you a, know a, a tra trade not, not only of goods, but but also of knowledge? Yeah. Like how many knots do you guys know? Uh, I, 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 at some uh, point Don? I might have known up to five. Now yes. I, I know one. <laughs> yeah. So like not, not tying was like a really key skill. Like the, the ability to know how to tie different knots, because basically you got to take two different things and attach them, two or more things and attach them together. The knot you tied them mattered and also depended, is this a knot that can survive in water? Is this a knot that's easy to undo or whatever? And we just kind of forget like like how critical little things like that are. You know, yeah. you watch people. It's funny when you watch people who are like, you know, on a Mr. Beast video or survival video and they have to go build a hut, you know, and because nobody knows other than Boy Scouts knows how to tie a knot. These things just fall apart quickly. Uh, yeah, and and let's not forget that you and I uh, just got back from a convention where all we did was meet with other magicians and swap really good ideas, and and, yeah. and people paid a lot of money to uh, travel out there, and we wanted some spectacle, and uh, and mainly it was just all everybody sharing knowledge. Yeah, yeah. So, I think that. Uh, these places are fascinating. And I think the more we look at why we do things today, it'll make sense for a lot of stuff because things that are just impractical that take too lot, too many resources don't last. Yep. Interesting. So, all of it's a lie. It's all fake. Uh, uh, and, another. And, oh, go ahead. What is it? Yeah. One more thing too, is that I've been I've been getting really into and, and I'll probably do a deeper dive with you guys on this, but studying a lot of you know memory 
palace techniques and methods like this. Mm -hmm. And you realize how prevalent they were and how many of these ancient monuments and things like this may actually have been ways of preserving knowledge in the form of structures that were lends itself to a memory palace. It can be very easy to sort of just, you know, just say, oh, well, you're, you're overthinking it, whatever. But, you know, what are the things that you put in cathedrals, stained glass windows? What do they do? They tell you the story of the Bible so you can sit there and not read and look around. And if you want to remember it, you'd be like, oh, the window on the south end, whatever, told me this, 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 et cetera. Mm. And we look at some of these monuments and stuff and you look at why are they carving these things there? Because there is a, there is a story there. There's a story they're trying to tell you. And, and memory palaces have both the things inside of our mind, but they can have physical forms and structures at which we erect to try to preserve this information. And it's interesting how much, uh, how much that influenced the middle ages, uh, leading to the Renaissance. But you look at, you know, Giordano Bruno persecuted by the inquisition. He was, uh, had built very complex memory techniques and some people thought it was superstitious. That was one of the things in the middle ages is people who could have exceptional recall from a trained mind were thought to be suspicious. You know, when they'd sent emissaries to China, one of them went there, actually, you know, taught them the whole memory palace technique, which was, you know, extremely useful sort of thing. But when you look at these monuments, you look at this sort of thing and say like, yeah, there's a lot more here than we sort of think. Well, and like uh, on the Gobekli Tepe, I, I could imagine like, um, we, we here in America tend to all live in very similar looking houses. So we kind of have this cultural uh, archetype or whatever, but I could totally see, make it like, it's an important for you to make a regular pilgrimage to remember these places so that everybody's using the same system of, of, of memory palaces. Yeah. And it, and it might be, you know, it might be the kind of thing that, only a few people really know it and everybody else comes and says, Oh, that's really cool. Um, but yeah, it can be absolutely a way that it is to, to preserve time or, you know, preserve information across time. And this think about this thing, this, this thing is 12,000 years old and there is a story here. And you start looking throughout Turkey and a lot of the other monuments and other things there, you see some very interesting things, including one statue I'm looking at right now with somebody projecting something straight at the camera, which I won't describe. <laughs> <laughs> What's also interesting, too, is you look at this and they're kind of crude. Well, literally crude, but also like you see like, yeah, that's not quite a perfect circle. You know, this is just sort of somebody just sort of winging it, you know, and then over time, people got very good at figuring these things out. But the T-stones throughout Turkey are very fascinating. Interesting. Do we, uh, uh, w was there any uh, big news in AI this week? Or, well, or, or we alternately, we can say, so those astronauts, they home yet? <laughs> no, Brian. No, they're not. Although I think since we last talked, it was, uh, uh, it was now more formally recognized that uh, they might have to come down in a, in a SpaceX vehicle. In a SpaceX vehicle. And, vehicle. Uh, and they are, it, it might stretch until next year. They might, they might be there for a while. They might be hunkering down. Uh I would imagine that if I were Boeing, I would, if I was in charge of Boeing's PR, I would be angry. There was, there was a really funny <laughs> uh, video. I mean, it's sad because there's two people that are stuck in space and uh, uh, their planes are falling apart. But it was funny on the internet of like uh, uh, Boeing's team building. And it was a video of a big team building thing where they had set up a, a gigantic Rube Goldberg, but it just kept stalling on every, <laughs> on everything. Like, like the ball would go down and then just like not hit the dominoes. And so they would have to just push the dominoes. So like their big moment of it going on, wasn't ruined. Uh, uh, but yeah, they're uh, not, uh, not doing great. Not a great year for old Boeing. I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, I mean Boeing's uh, did the 737 Maxes too, right? That yes. They, that they, it's, it's been a minute since Boeing's really knocked one out of the park. Yeah, hopefully things will fall in line and yeah. whatnot. I would say that the big kind of thing happening in AI, AI right now is... Uh, uh, Me not having the voice mode, even though my two best friends have it. Is it that? Is that the number yeah. one thing in AI? Because yeah. 
I've uh-huh. certainly gotten a lot of updates on my test flight, but uh, boy, none of them are the voice mode that my two friends have and enjoy all the time. Boy, I'd love it. Just so hey, everybody knows. what advice would you give to my friend who still doesn't have the advanced voice mode? Gosh, dang it. If, if they don't have advanced voice mode yet, tell them to keep their app updated, as features often roll out over time or in stages. And if they're really eager, they might want to check the app settings or FAQ for any specific requirements or announcements. Anything else they're curious about? Well, it might be a while. What could they do instead of talking to you in this amazing advanced voice mode? Maybe like something like a sock puppet or something? Any suggestions you have to make them pass the time? A sock puppet is a classic choice. They could also try recording voice memos or videos as a creative outlet. I hate this guy. <laughs> I hate this guy. Shut up, guy. No, no uh, one cares about you. That, uh, it's not quite as advanced, but it's a great way to connect. <laughs> or, of course, they can chat with me through text. Any other fun diversions you have in mind? He loved your suggestions. No, He's going to get on them right away. <laughs> uh, last night, I uh, I just told it. I said, hey, Tell me a bedtime story and just make it increasingly more boring so I fall asleep. And I started doing it with too much pep, and I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Dial down the energy. Just, you know, you're trying to soothe me. And it says, I'm sorry. Brian, once there was a prince. <laughs> it, it's, it's Meanwhile, I got all I have to do is go, meanwhile, Sansa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so kind of the big news out in California is there is a bill, uh, a state bill about trying to regulate an AI and, uh, every AI researcher in California I know is not happy with this. And the safety researchers I know who are actually technical safety people are not happy with the people who are like, you know, safety researchers in the sense that they write stuff in Microsoft word. I don't know, but anyhow, um, and it's a it's it's a really problematic thing. They've changed. They made some changes to it, but the you know the problem is it's like, hey, if we think you're building a threatening model and we are upset with you, then you're you're guilty. It's just really really written, I think, from a point of uh, not realizing where the technology is and how negatively it's going to impact like a bunch of smaller labs trying to do stuff and not solve a problem. It will make us, it will make things more dangerous. It, 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 is, it, it, is it looks a box. little bit like they were aiming for regulatory capture and it's basically. No, I, I don't agree with that at all. Okay. All right. I, well, I, uh, 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 it, that, it was that, damaging that not, open not, source. That is not the history of the California state house and stuff like this. Like the, 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 it, it is, it is a one party state for which, uh, it, it is what it says on on the tin. They they I, genuinely want to put big restrictor plates on the industry because those are the voices that they are listening to. In my opinion, uh, yeah, it, it was. If you're, it, it just kind of hacks everybody. And I don't mean to I didn't mean to apologize for dismissing that so quickly, Brian. I'm sorry, I, but I, I would say that there there has been the knee jerk kind of like, oh, it's the big companies trying to shut down the small. Like no, like. The big companies are going to be the ones that are going to have a tremendous amount of scrutiny, you know, all over them because like, well, you can't if you're spending more than this and you've got to be giving us constant updates and you have to go before a committee to approve this sort of thing. And then it's just going to affect across the ecosystem. It's going to be bad for not it's not good for large companies like Anthropic went in and pushed to say, hey, we need changes in this because we're not going to be able to do what we want to do. Um it's a thing where basically if you're building large frontier models, they're going to say, you know, if you're building the next version of Claude or chat or GPT or whatever, that California could come in and say, no, nope, too dangerous because reasons and well, we're going to shut you down. That's yeah. a, a quite literally what made me bristle uh, when they described it on uh, whatever podcast I was listening to was the constant use of, of that pernicious phrase reasonable amount I, we're not saying you can't build the next big thing but if you know it just needs to be reasonable and if it's not reasonable then the state needs to step in that that and, was the part that that, that frustrated yeah. me yep and the the problem is this this is i i did a talk i did a talk uh night before last for reason magazine at a reason event and i do a talk called the safety paradox and it is in my opinion all of the current popular legislation we're hearing will make us less safe. It will make us less safe. It will have the opposite effect. Because you say, 
they changed, they're changing a provision first because they said, oh, we're going to measure this by the amount of compute, like 10 to the 25 amount of flops, how much compute processing you use to generate these models. And it's like, okay, so if I use 10 to the 24 on 10 different models to generate, you know, my embeddings or whatever to build another model, that's fine. And it'd be like, uh, what? You know, they just don't understand even how these things systems are built. Also, it's like, what, what am I worried about? Am I worried about Anthropic building a next level of AGI with hundreds of researchers studying and working on this thing? Or some bad state actor taking a bunch of open source models, which I think we should have, by the way, you know, 10,000, you know, researchers in China building thousands of open source models are building, you know, these tiny 2 billion parameter models that can infect your computer system, you know, in theory, maybe I don't mean to scare anybody. Like I'm worried about that other thing. Yeah. I, I want the big model. I want, I want, I want GPT five. I want Claude five. I want these things out there because they're going to be my best way. If we're getting, you know, attacked and we get rogue AIs, they're going to be the best ways to stop it. So, uh, do you think the 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 there is frustration with, uh, uh, you know, state interaction with industry often, but certainly the tech industry is something that we have seen become more decentralized recently, uh, uh, certainly over the last 10 years. Would you think that if this does go into effect that you would see more uh, uh, AI startups uh, headquarter in places that are not California? I think that, you know, how they define their operations, how they, you know, uh, the, the, the getting into the specifics of saying, okay, if I'm headquartered here, but I train my model elsewhere, do I have to comply? You yeah. know, they may say, yes, absolutely. You know, but then it's like, okay, well, you know, there, there's a lot of different ways you can get around things by basically saying, okay, well, I'm going to be a VC fund and I'm just going to fund things or have stakes and stuff. I do think that there's a lot of ways around it to try to avoid it if it becomes a bit onerous. Um, I do think that if you're the, the thing that you have here, like I was at a party last night, like at a, a startup that's got uh, building really cool AI application stuff. They're like a small four or five person team funded, you know, like incredibly well funded, whatever. For them, the advantage of being where they, they are in SF is you can throw a party and meet some cool talent yeah. if you want to expand. That's the big hard part. That's the thing you have to think about to say, okay, um, if I leave here, you know, where else do I find the talent? The you know, talent. you're getting, yeah. Yeah. Uh, XAI is locating, I think, in like Tennessee, um, Austin, other places. People are like, you know, kind of spreading out. So I, I think there's a chance that, you know, you might decide, you know, if you're, you know, you're a big company, like if you're an Anthropic or an open AI and you're like, you know what, people will move with us, then you might just move, you know, you might, you know, leave. Well, especially considering, you know, there is such a, a pull for talent that's very young, engineering talent that's very, very young, that's coming either right out of a partial stint in college or college itself. And, and you know, the question is, all right, if, if we pay you six figures, then you're 19, you have no idea what to do with the money in SF or Kalamazoo. Uh, what do you want to do? Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm curious. I'm always, I, I tend to be a pessimist on the like, oh, like California is going to chase the tech away. Cause I do think that there are, as you pointed out, uh, main systemic advantages there. Uh, but at the same time, like we've watched the concept of the office degrade over the last four years. And, and while I do wonder if that is a trend that will always be, uh, you know, at the direction that it is right now, I I do think that there's probably real questions about whether or not we're going to go back to 2019 levels of office occupancy. I do think that if you're a startup now, you're probably not thinking about the big office in the way that you were five years ago. So, well, I let me I'll, I'll give you I'll give you kind of a the landscape of SF sort of business. Okay, the younger hotter, faster moving AI companies, you know, are like probably doing three days a week in office. Yeah. Uh, you could probably figure that the, the more traditional tech companies in AI are still doing remote work. And you can t see that from the pace, the really, really, really like the, the, the event I went to last night, you know, these are four founders, four or five founders living in the same house. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And they are, uh, they are, uh, 
you know, a hot AI company building a really cool product and they're all living, they are set, they are, they are living in the they're, office they're seven in days the tube. a week. Yeah. And part, why did, and why would, you know, why did they get funding? Part of it was they're like, they're like, even one of them has like a spouse that's there that doesn't even work for the company, but they're like, Hey honey, uh, we want to build, it'd be great easier if we just lived here and did that. She's like, okay. And did that. And you just, that's, you're seeing that mentality. Like there are houses of like hacker houses and founders right now living in the same house, just like jamming, building stuff, whatever. So, uh, I would say that, you know, but they, you know, some of these, you sort of reach a point, you can kind of be like, okay, we can be an escape velocity that we can build our thing. And then if it's hard to do what you want to do, go elsewhere. And also if you're doing something different, like if you're biotech or something like that, you know, I know companies that, you know, I, you know, go to, go to offices, you know, downtown and, you know, they've got written out, we work space, but they've also got us, you know, another group of team working on the East coast and some other space. And it might be like, you know what? West Coast team, you got to move to the East Coast because just yeah. to go work over there. Yeah, it'll be interesting. A lot of, lot of, I, I know I feel like one of these like tech vibey kind of people, but man, like it's just neat to see just people building stuff. I, I think that there's there's a lot of really, really fascinating and interesting things that are happening. And, and you know, who knows where the economy is going to go. But at, at a certain point, the interest rates are going to drop. The money is going to really turn on again in tech. And uh, we're going to see a lot of stuff because like, there's a lot of stuff being funded right now. That is really, really interesting. Yeah. There's, there's stuff that's just, it's what I've seen in the pipeline. Things are going to be coming out. Um, you know, uh, really, really just not, it's, there's just, there's nothing slow. More people working on this stuff now than ever. More things coming out. It's yeah. just crazy. It's a shame crazy. they're going to do it uh, after the AI bubble burst because it's a Fed. Oh well, my God! I I yeah. definitely read that headline. Yeah. It's a Fed. It's, yeah. I, I'll it's give you. Fed. I'll give you an example. Like just a thing. Like uh, ah, uh, how to describe this? Like uh, there's going to be, yeah, there's a bunch of dumb money in AI. There's going to be dumb money. There's going to be companies mm -hmm. folding and people are like, oh, in a first time that like, you know, there's a first time that there's a glut of GPUs that aren't being used in one quarter and NVIDIA the next quarter sells fewer. People are going, oh, it's done. It's over. And it's going to be like, all right. Yeah, keep thinking that. But um, you're going to see automation tools and stuff coming out for like your computer and stuff like this. Imagine, you know, AI that controls everything, what you do. And as you, the more people use these tools, the smarter they get. Yeah. Uh, just in the next two years, we're going to totally be a very, very different way. We even interact with computers and we get stuff done. Yeah. Uh, and not, not needing like newer, super more capable models, like literally say, Hey, watch what I'm doing right now. And then now that you know what I'm trying to do, I need you to do that every day, Tuesday at 9 p.m. Well, and and again, like the the metaphor I keep trying to explain to people who are scared of AI is like you have an intern now. So just like an intern can sit here and watch me open audition, edit this audio, post to Patreon. It's like you only have to watch it a few times and it's like, yeah, now you got it. Go. Yeah. Yeah, it's a. Uh... I, I, you know, I did a talk and I had somebody go like, Hey, is this real this time? Is this AI real this time? It's like, it's like, brother, like I spent an hour, an hour the other day talking to chat GPT on a scientific topic, you know, an hour, like, like that was real. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I actually, I did that with my Amish tools. <laughs> I, I get it uh, uh, this morning uh, on on the topic that the new world's greatest con is going to be about. We're just like I was just I just wanted to be more read up on the the world in which things are set. Stuff that we that may or may not interact with the story, but just so I understood more of it. And I just did a thirty minute conversation about this specific. Uh, 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 details of uh, uh, warfare, and it's like, oh, wow, that's cool. I, I literally, this all happened on my phone, in my headphones. Uh, uh, that's pretty rad. And you're using you're using a sexually essentially a second generation model yep. from GPT three, like yep. just a second generation model of GPT three that has uh, that has six months worth of data about how people talk to things and have conversations. 
what happens when you get two years of that experience and a slightly better model? And I guess people aren't ready. I mean, ready. and then I'm not ready. One of the stories that uh, is told on the new world's greatest con is Brian telling a story about magic convention. And it got me thinking about uh, the, the, the habit of magicians to almost exclusively only use popular songs with the word magic in it. Uh, and so I just had Udio make a easy listening 70s rock song only using terms about card magic. And it was uh, 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 hilarious. It made me laugh. Uh, I live a better life thanks to AI. And you yeah. can also, you know, listen to an Eminem song that brought back Abracadabra. I know, right? Exactly. Yeah, because now the rap song samples the old song. Yeah, yeah Dua Lipa had a song, uh, Houdini, too. So uh, get get ready, yeah. magicians. New songs added yeah. to the repertoire. Do we have any picks? Uh, I got a weird pick. Uh, it's, um, uh, uh, I, I, I ran out of patience. Uh, I made it about 500 episodes into old-time radio suspense before I realized these are just really crappily, poorly written stories. <laughs> <laughs> 100 episodes in, I picked that up. Well, I mean, the early ones are some of the classics. You know, you, you get your Orson Welles and these high-effort performances, but other ones, it just sounds like Somebody went to the went to the kitchen and just started banging stuff around and had a woman go ah, and then they had a dude walk in and said uh, the murder was done by him at the end. Uh, but uh, so I tried something different the last couple of nights and I like it a lot. I believe it's called the Twilight Zone podcast and it seems to have come out in 2011 and basically. It's not episodes of the Twilight Zone. It's it's just the guys categorically going through all of the episodes and and pointing out cool things about them. And he gives a synopsis of what's covered and uh, uh, plays a clip here or a clip there, and then uh, 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 does specials now and again. I don't know. I'm like uh, seven episodes into it, and I I really dig it. He he also dug up like uh, weird stuff. Like he said, hey, I got a bit of a cold. You could probably hear it, but I want to keep this project rolling. So uh, I'm going to play something that came from the 1970s. I don't really know if this is good or not or how to feel about it, but it is curious in that it's introduced and wrapped up by Rod Serling. And that's, that's, a, that's a weird thing to, to, to see. Hope you enjoy it. Uh, you tell me at this address, whether or not you liked it or not. But, but uh, yeah, the, the Twilight Zone podcast, let me, let me put up the right album art here, but uh, I'll, I'm, I'm digging it. Very nice. Cool. Uh, so Ash and I ran out of the shows that we were watching, and so we were just looking for something to pick up and uh, wound up on Netflix watching, uh, it was a Peacock original, uh, from the people that brought you 30 Rock and the unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt is Girls 5 Eva, uh, which very much like 30 Rock, which took place in a heightened Saturday Night Live uh, world and made fun of television and fame a lot. This is a girls group from the 90s that is now, through hilarious circumstances, reforming. But almost note for note is shot and written like the previous two shows. So if you enjoyed, if you've gotten to the end of 30 Rock, if you've gotten to the end of Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, then Girls 5 Eva is like just, it's new versions of that. The jokes are, are funny. It's it's a very high high shot attempt and uh, uh, I've I've enjoyed it. It's been very funny. Cool. I saw Twisters Ooh. with my wife. Have you seen this? I have not, no. So, backstory, the original Twister movie was from a story by Michael Crichton and written by him and his wife at the time. And, you know, I, I love Michael Crichton. I don't, I'd be very curious to know what he would be making of, like, current AI and everything else like this. But 
one of the things I loved about Michael Crichton was the way that he would portray his, his, you know, everybody has sort of their genre and, you know, if you're writing cop stuff, procedurals, your, your real people are cops. You know, if you're writing courtroom, your real people are your lawyers. And Michael Crichton was the best and still the best today at scientists as people, you know, people in science that are doing this, not scientists be weirdos, but we're just going to go into a room full of scientists you know, or a situation where everybody around is involved in science and that's just the normal thing and not like, oh, the guy with the laptop in the corner, you know, well, everybody, let me tell you what I did. You know, yeah. it's 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 why science writing is often very bad and people try to do it. They still don't get it where he's like he understood he'd been, you know, he was, you know, he had a medical degree. He'd been around scientists his whole life and he understands what it's like to just, hey, these are people that argue, have relationships, whatever yeah. and all that. So Twister, the first movie Twister, you know, it's popcorn. It's a it's a summer movie. I watched it with my wife. She had never seen it. And she was like, this really holds up. The originals, it holds up remarkably well. I'm like, yeah, like it's it's very 90s and sort of the cheese in some of the moments. But the VFX and the original were very, very good. And John DeBont, probably a crazy person, probably difficult to work with, did a great job of making that first one so good. So when they were going to do a new one, Twisters, I'm like, all right, you know, curious. And I watched the trailer. I go, this is kind of cool and kind of like a let's tell the story, you know, a similar sort of story. Not ignore that the first one could have happened, whatever, but talk about Tornado Chasers. And it was really fun and not a perfect movie, but uh, I thought the the cast was great. Um, you know, it was, you know, about people who are into science and come from different approach, you know, um, really, you know, just enjoyed it. Um, I, I, you know, I think that if you get a chance to see it, like again, just if you want a fun movie about people t chasing down tornadoes, um, do it. And I think that they portray all the scientists of people who have like a very fascination with storms and what they do. And you have kind of your two characters are the, uh, the Kate Carter played by Daisy Edgar Jones. And she's this, you know, researcher who's been researching tornadoes. There's a backstory there. And then you have Glenn Powell, who you see in the commercials is like, kind of the, the tornado chaser guy, the cowboy kind of guy who, you know, and what I loved too was he is a guy that's a tornado chaser, like in live streams it. And you just accept it. Yeah. You know, it's just a thing. He shows up, Hey, we're going to go live right now. He's talking to the camera. They sell t-shirts. They do this sort of stuff. And, and it, and just the fact that like, like for somebody who spent years working in television and thought like getting your own TV special or TV show was sort of the pinnacle of this. And to realize that the starting point of this is like, Oh, he's famous. How is he famous? Oh, well, he's a famous live streamer who goes into tornadoes. Yeah. And you're like, <laughs> no, yeah, that's the norm. That's the yep. norm. That's where we are right now. That you think of 10 years ago, like, Oh, the YouTube guy, whatever, like, like, no, he's famous. Cause that's how you do fame now. So. No. Well, and, and because, um, you know, it, it, we've it, 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 there's a competitive group of people who are all playing that game. You know, it's um, uh, it, they, they exist. <laughs> yeah. So the screenplay, by the way, so it was directed by uh, Lee Isaac Chung, who's done things like some, you know, men are some really, you know, really well done character drama stuff, which I thought was a good choice. And the script, uh, let me see, who was it? Story and screenplay. Um, but story was by Joseph Kaczynski. And, you know, Joseph Kaczynski has been one of these people who has kind of quietly becoming more and more prominent. Um, he directed uh, Top Gun Maverick. Uh, he directed uh, Start Off with Tron Legacy, which I was like, it was an interesting idea in Oblivion, but he kept kind of getting just, I think, better and better. And then, you know, Top Gun Maverick and then, you know, his capabilities I thought were great. Um, he, you know, and did that. He's, he wrote, uh, he's directing the new F1 movie, which I don't know if you've seen the trailer for that. Yeah. That looks crazy. So anyhow, are you on, um, you're, you're, you're on, you're on the Glenn Powell hype train. I think he's likable. I think he's charismatic. Uh, I, I think that, you know, uh, where I have a casting time machine, man, we could have had a very interesting Han Solo movie. Um, mm. So, yeah, I think he's 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 I think he pulls it off really well. You know, he seems comfortable in the leading man role. So there we go. How about you? You are you on it? Are you into yeah. it? Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm, no, I, oh, yeah, I'm I'm buying. I'm I... yeah, no, I, I, I like the his his uh, his Netflix movie with Richard Linklater. I, the I, Hitman. 
yeah, I had very, very big questions about the third act and where they go in the story, but I thought it was it was electric chemistry with him and the leading lady. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's a very, very easily charismatic kind of guy. And so I think, you know, I think there's gonna be a lot of opportunity for him. Oh, gentlemen. Mm-hmm. It's been weird. Hey, no. Ooh, nailed it. I was afraid somebody was about to talk, but I gotcha. I gotcha. Uh, oh, boy. oh, damn it. Oh. Uh, I, um. Uh, what, what do we want to talk about in after things? I got some things to talk about. We talk a little bit about Magic Live, the value of networking. Okay. Um, All right. Well, here, I'll I'll just put this blank thing on for a second while I, I run to the restroom. Oh, I'm just going to go. All right. Hello, friend. Oh, man. Oh, Justin is back. <laughs> Look at that. I'm back. Look at that. Well, now I've seen everything. Hey. All right. You ready to bring us in? Yeah. I think I got this. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> Three, two, one. Hello and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Maine, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hey! And Mr. Brian Brushwood. Well, howdy, guys. 
So Brian and I uh, were last week at a, uh, how should we describe it, Brian? A, uh, a, a conclave? A, uh, oh, a, 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 a secret congregation of protectors of ancient secrets. That anybody who stumbles across the website can sign up and go to. But yes. And uh, we were at Magic Live. Live. Magic Live, the uh, Justin, uh, the the the, 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 the yeah. preeminent uh, magic convention put on by the uh, fine folks at Magic Magazine. It is uh, it is always the 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 one place where magicians from around the world gather. That and Blackpool and a few other ones, but this yeah, one is just... cool because it's held in Las Vegas, and so it's a, one of the larger magic conventions. And being in Vegas, you see. David Copperfield shows up, David Blaine, you know, comes through and whatnot. And, you know, for me, I've been going now. This was, I hadn't gone in like 10 years and I went last year and I had a great time. And we just run in, you just run into people, you know, you've known for a long time, people working in the business. And then there's this, it's a, the Orleans hotel, uh, you know, the fan, yes, the Orleans hotel, everybody. Ah, you know, yes. Las Vegas. Yes. Uh, I want to build a hotel, but imagine an ashtray, if you will, <laughs> but the size of a hotel. Uh, I'm going to have not only hot, but scalding hot water come out of the faucets. Yeah, it so, gets uh, hot fast, and you don't have a yeah. choice on both taps. Yeah. It's it's just hot water, really hot, really fast. Yeah, but uh, you go there for the people, and there's a lot of really fun shows that go on. And one of the things that's cool about this place is that there is a in the casino floor there's an area called the mardi gras bar big huge thing probably 100 seats or something like this and you this is a convention where people will even come from out of town if they don't have because they the registration closed off and they didn't get registrations they'll still come there just to go hang out with the other magicians everybody there because you go to that thing and it's just filled with magicians sharing stuff talking magic whatever and then at night uh the uh the the local vegas magicians you know come out of their coffins and you know are their showrooms and show up and it's just really really fun you've got to hang out with banachek you know and, and talk with him and uh i don't know the last time you saw that guy in person but that dude looks good that oh, dude yeah. looks really good no oh, ba- ba- we, we may be experiencing peak banachek <laughs> yeah 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 so he's he's amazing i check check him out on the world's greatest con on the alpha project but uh he's just a great guy but just neat to see you know people you'd run into there so it was just really a lot of fun and and you know i went to an event last night which was uh one of the things about the tech scene in san francisco is that like there are like kind of events or parties going on all the time there's stuff going on and literally like nerds getting together to go, you know, it'll be a house thing here, house thing there, whatever, but there's spaces and stuff. And then last night, you know, we were leaving, you know, one thing and this, the, my wife and I are giving somebody a ride, you know, to the Caltrain station. And they're like, Oh, if you want to go over to this place. Yeah. There's this other space, this hacker space. That's like 24 seven people there. If you just want to show up and hang out. And that's really, I think such an important, if you look at when we're curved, you know, we're, culture flourishes when uh things prosperity comes from when you look at like you know entrepreneurship etc you find that you find that why did greek civilization kind of have this big leap well one they had you know their merchants trading they had the entire mediterranean to go across and bring ideas to and so that even though you're on the maybe remote island whatever somebody comes into town you talk to them you exchange ideas you have that you know, you have part of the Renaissance. You look at places that, you know, Florence and Vienna, and you look at these other places that became these like centers of information. And we trade, you know, wanted to do that. Ben Franklin, Ben Franklin wanted to be, you know, wanted to be very, very prosperous, successful. So what did he do? He got together a bunch of other people, uh, you know, around his age and said, let's create our own club. You know, create, you know, the, the, was it the Gentoo? And basically it was like, let's meet and talk. Let's do this. This is what I tell people who want to learn AI. I'm like, get a bunch of friends that want to learn AI and meet with them every week and talk about this. And I just can't, you know, I can't emphasize enough how much this is. And some people go like, yeah, but I don't know anybody. I don't like find it. And, and you can, you can create things now virtually. You could say, I want to do, I have, I'm interested in AI and comics, you know, great. Put a thing out there and tell people I'm going to talk every Tuesday night on AI and comics. Anybody wants to show up, show up. 
you know, use a Google Meet, whatever. You would be amazed how quickly you can get a group of people together and create your own organization and increase your own knowledge. Uh, and I've, I've also found that uh, even just purely in online forums, uh, like uh, pick somebody on X, Twitter, who you respect and like, and just ask them, hey, I'm trying to get into this. Are there any groups you know of that, that meet on a regular basis? That, and then just uh, people, people, people love it when their group is popular. And yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like you just... Networking is, it is one of the things that is just, networking became this sort of, we, we think of it as sort of this opportunistic sort of way to meet people to get a thing. And that was the, yeah. I'd go to networking events and it was literally, who do you know that's hiring? Who do you know that has something for me? And, and it's just like, that's the worst kind of networking. The really kind of good networking is, who can I know? Who can I know? What can I share? What can be shared with me? How can I how can I create a network to share information so we all get kind of smarter? I remember going to like networking events. And I didn't like to go to them like in South Florida and stuff, but a lot of it was just people were just always kind of looking for somebody who was the angle into something. And it wasn't really like, let's use this as an opportunity to really just share information and do that. And really good networks, that's what they really do is that one part of the node gets some information that's useful. Everybody else in the node has that information and then it keeps sharing that. I meet once a week with a group of developers, AI developers, and so much of what I do is informed by somebody said, oh, I tried this out or I did yeah. this, whatever. So, you know, I, I think the, the, the maxim that I've always had is, you know, if you're in a group of people, like, what can I do for them? Right. If you are, yeah. if you are operating on that level, you will have a much better time than if you're thinking about what they can do for you. What, what, you want to do if you tap into your network is to have a very specific thing that you would like to do and then do ask tap into your network and say how how would you guys think that this would be a thing to do otherwise opportunities are going to fall into your lap if you are somebody that is known as a trustworthy b self-motivated and c always willing to pitch in because that will never go out of style ever you you will you will never be like man these people that are uh, 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 too selfless we need to get them out of here like that's this is this is mucking the whole thing up you'll always be somebody that's um that's in the center I I was I've been booked recently uh, on Sky News Arabia so if anybody if do we have any crossover of uh, uh, viewers of After Things and Sky News Arabia that's yes indeed that is me that has been on there. And the guy that's booked it is uh, a magician. And so he's like, oh, uh, I'm, I'm going to Magic Live. I, I just looked you up. I saw that you are a magician. And I'm like, well, not technically, but uh, I, I still do have many, most of my best friends are, are magicians and I'm, I'm well-versed in that field. Uh, uh, I'm going to just miss you. I'm going to be in Vegas for DEF CON. And so we start talking yesterday as he's booking me for the show yesterday. And he's like, it's like, yeah, I was shocked. I was in a... Uh, uh, a a uh, a talk by uh, uh, this guy Brian Brushwood, and then I saw your face on the screen <laughs> because I'm in Brian's slide for one of our one of our silly stories, and uh, and he's like, like yeah, and then I'm like, uh, like why are you at DefCon? And I'm like, oh, just my friend. And he's you know a couple years ago he needed help, and so I've just kept going out there and helping him. And he's like, you have a lot of different friends. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, you know, I guess, I guess I am, I guess. But, but really it's like to this conversation, every step of the way has come from me beginning a friendship saying, let's either do something together. Let's build something together. Or how can I help? Like yeah. that's always like in, in, in Darren, Andrew, Brian, uh, that was the beginning of it. And for Andrew, it was beginning with him, taking time out of his day to help uh, 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 an after school program and that sneak onto a call a high school campus. Yeah, just, exactly. Just, just, just like any there. normal guy. Uh, <laughs> what, what, what kind of impressionable minds are here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's just, it's, and it's also good Lord. Is it the skeleton key to find people that are real? Like those, that's it's it's very quickly understood if somebody is literally just talking to you to find out what you can do for them versus what they can do for you. 
Yeah, there I, is is it is it pure intuition that that we have to ride on for that, or or is there more objective techniques to be to, to sniff out where it's like, oh, you want something? Okay, all right. I I think that you sort of see things over time about that, and also just like what the nature of the group is. If it's just a thing, we're like, hey, we're going to come in and share things, and and. Just avoid the word networking. Just avoid that. Just think about like, oh, we're gonna we're gonna be talking about this. So I'd say that's one thing SF is great about. We talked about this in the previous Weird Things episode about like what's the attraction of SF. I'm like, there's talent and there's also this culture of get a bunch of people into a room, have a party, and people talk about stuff. Uh, but I think that you just you can start from there and you know, like I said, if you want to find your way into the thing, the quickest way to do that is just be be in a network and do this. And, and funny thing, so I did this talk two nights ago. And uh, I was talking about AI and stuff. And there were some other people that were like kind of really kind of interesting and having kind of a casual conversation. And then somebody mentioned an inter- interest in, you know, uh, weird subcultures. I go, well, I'm in, you know, magic subculture. That's pretty weird. I got back from Magic Live two weeks ago. And then, boom, turned out they had been fascinated magician, who knew many of the same magicians I have. You know, I've been, uh, uh, there's a, kind of a very private magic thing in, in LA, not the magic castle, but something else that I supported. They both supported. We both bought chairs to support for. And it was just this crazy kind of nexus of I was there to talk about AI, but yeah. then magic keeps pulling you back in and you just find out, oh my God, we have so many mutuals. And that's one of the benefits of when you can, you know, I can go to, you know, a writer's conference, you know, thriller writer's conference and have conversations about, you know, thriller writing genre stuff. I can go to magic convention, and have a conversation with people about magic convention. And I can go to, scuba divers talk about this and the more kind of things you get into and talk to people about that you realize you see a lot of overlap too like i went to an event last night and ran into a guy who's kind of familiar and i realized like i met this person at a vc dinner like months and months ago and you know the statistical likelihood in, in san francisco is a small city but you go like oh that's sort of how is this happening but you find out these networks often reinforce yeah yeah, I mean, if oh. anybody's listening and they're like, well, yeah, but you guys are doing a podcast. You guys are good at this kind of stuff. Like, literally. Funny st- funny story. <laughs> uh, uh, just just be helpful. Just plug in and, 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 and you know, don't, like, I don't know. I, uh, listen, I, to, to Brian's point of view, you know, it's like, oh, how can you tell? Well, the ideal friendship is one in which both things are happening at all times, right? You are willing to help your friend at all times. You are willing to be helped by your friend at all times. So the harder thing is somebody sensing that you are willing to pitch in. And therefore, on the other side, it is somebody who seems to give a general sense of wanting to help you. And so it's like, if you feel that, then it's real. I, a party I went to last night literally was held at a house with a bunch of, you know, a, a startup and, you know, one of their engineers is actually cooking. You want to show up and he's cooking and people live there and whatever. And I see there's paper plates and stuff in the counter. I just started just setting stuff up. Yeah. You know, I just yeah. started like, oh, let me set this up, move this over there, whatever. First, like, what? You, and it was this, it's like, yeah, like, this is a party. I'm happy to help out, you know? Yeah. And, and you just sort of, you see that kind of thing. If you showed up and you're like, Oh well, who's the most important person I can talk to? And you know, yeah. it's not going to work out so well. No. So steps to starting one: number one, you pick a topic, something you want to do, and you can say, "Hey, every Tuesday night, you know, from eight to ten p.m., you can meet. If you want to meet in person, you can, if it's a thing that works for meeting in person, you can do that. If you want to meet online, you do that. I have a thing every Thursday. I meet with a regularly. I've been doing this now for four years. The, the group of people I talk about tech. You set a time, you set a thing, this is the time. And then you can just be very generous with who gets to come in, whatever. Uh, if you feel free to police it, whatever, but just set a fixed time that people know, oh yeah, every night at 8 p.m. or Monday at 8 p.m., whatever, there's this thing going on. They don't don't make it, make it casual, you know, just make it a thing. You want to show up, show up, whatever. And then that will make people feel more comfortable coming in and being part of it. And how do you get people to it? Think of anybody you know who's into it. Tell them, hey, I'm doing this thing. Let's sit here and talk about this. And it might take a little time, but every time you talk about this to somebody else and somebody else becomes part of it, you have another advocate for the thing. Yeah. And you get this, you know, and it gets, it's, you know, Metcalf's law, this exponential effect pretty soon, you know, you will find a lot of people hear about it because it's also, it's not just, 
you know, let's say uh, Brian, Justin, and I wanted to just talk about, you know, weird things. AI, no, AI generated <laughs> comics. Let's say we, we're, we're comic book artists. We also, we were like, we're the guys that think, hey, it's okay to use AI. They're like, okay, well, let's like Tuesday night, let's do it. We'll do a thing. Well, here's what's going to happen is, you know, we're all married. Our spouses are going to know. Our spouses are going to be talking to people too. Yeah, our weirdo husbands, you know, they get together and talk about this. Oh, I have a weirdo husband or I have a weirdo wife that might like to be part of this. Oh, yeah, I'll put you in touch. Next thing you know, you know, your your vectors don't just increase with each member. It also increases with each member and everybody who knows them and what you're doing. And, uh, you know, per the network effect, I mean, like the value of what you're doing grows exponentially. And it's like... Uh, uh, how do you become the highest status person in the most important network about something? You show up first because like uh, people come to us asking for advice on podcasting, on launching brands, on writing and all that stuff. And it's like, just, 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 just go, just be the first to invite everyone to the party basically. Yeah. Got any well, picks? <laughs> it's all for that. Nailed uh, it. I I just saw an a, a Google thing that came up with literally. I opened up Twitter to see if there's any relevant story or something I need, and I see a thing for uh, a thing called Network School. <laughs> I'm like, oh, what is this? NS.com, and basically it's a uh, an academic community near Singapore. Uh, with basically trying to create like some new, what is network school? Let me, I guess this is, you know, just trying, trying to create all another people group who like, are appreciating the classic film network. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, they're it's, mad as hell and anymore. they're not going to take it yeah. anymore. Are you mad as hell Which, and not going to take not being in network school anymore? <laughs> Join us. Yeah. Things we should have been taught in school. Yep. So picks. Ah, uh, man, uh, 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 I don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I'll tell you what. You want to know what I've been using uh, uh, a lot more is... A cane, because you're getting old and going to be a dad. All right. You know what? I do have a pick. Keep it's it. the advanced mode on <laughs> chat. <laughs> oh, see, <laughs> you do. You're just bullies. <laughs> bullies, the both of you. <laughs> Um, I, uh, uh, I've been using a lot of the Apple native stuff for like more work related, uh, things, uh, especially tagging features and notes and messages have been, uh, uh, helpful. I've, I've, I've wound up using them more and I, I feel like uh, things have gotten done in a way that normally the, those apps are kind of like, it's like a, a friendly thing, but also, like, I don't know. I'm, I'm very obsessed with the idea of keeping Slack forever off my phone. I, I don't particularly even like using Discord for work things. And people kind of keep wanting to push these conversations to other stuff. But I've, I've found that messages has been at least good. Like, like Brian and I and uh, 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 Will Saddleberg for World's Greatest Connor on one. And it's like I put stuff in there and I tagged them both with the things I wanted to say. And it's like, Oh, I feel like I'm getting most of the functionality of what you would want in a, tell me, in a tell, me tell me again, tell me again what you're doing. Uh, oh, just at their name. If you like, so we have our, um, uh, this is within IMS. Yeah. Within on, iMessage. On, so on here we go. We have a little, uh, Andrew. It's in the computer. Main and Brian. What? So we have a little group chat, right? Right. And I'll just type Andrew. Um. Yeah, I'll just I'm tagging you in a in a text message. Huh. Yeah. That's so nice. <laughs> um, so I don't so know whether or not it, 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 at, at... Yeah, I don't know if it comes up as as a in any kind of special um alert or anything like that but uh at least when how did you tag me again to say me this literally at, message? and then okay and then so like slack but it's that's why it's not working for me okay got it it's not working for you no but uh there we go uh fun fact you know the whole bump on the apple iphone 
you know, yeah. tap and you see to share contacts. I've been doing that a lot. I was at two different conferences and I did that a lot. Uh, and I would say, I click done. And guess what? On my iPhone, it's not doing. Really? Saving them, not saving them. Wow. You, uh, yeah. I was, I, there's like a second step. You have to hit one of the buttons at the bottom or something. What? I click done. And then there's like a thing at the top. It'll say like edit or done. And I click done. And then it says it's done. And I go look for it. And it's not there. I lost a dozen people and some really important people that I wanted to, you know, and so I got like, and I, last night, somebody else had the same thing. So. Yeah. Uh, I I, I don't know. It, it is a cool feature. I too. (laughs) I too was handing out placebos (laughs) all convention long. Yeah. So, uh, not, not cool. Anyway, that was my pick. That's great. No, I didn't know you could tag them now and tag them really nice messages like that. Yeah. That's really good. And then if you're doing collaborative notes, it's also helpful for that. Like if you just want to alert somebody to a thing that you're doing within the same shared note, you can tag them and it'll pop up a little alert. Yeah, I think messages, uh, other than my horrific, horrific experience of which I've lost contacts for people that are – Opportunities may never happen again, and I'm going to, you know, <laughs> not bitter. Um, I think that the thing, the advantage of this, these tech is that it, it makes it very, very useful um, for safety and security reasons. And so I'm kind of excited about the future of that. So, yeah. Do you know where, while we're all doing tech talk on here, do you know where I can adjust my contact info on here? Because, like, I've tried to do that. and um, Adjust your contact info? Like the stuff stuff I share because I go look to see what I share and I'm like oh like uh, I want to share my email address but it's like no here's just your phone number like um, okay is it in contacts and you just tap your contact I don't know I have like two contacts in there because you know the whole Apple create multiple accounts thing anyhow welcome to the weird things thing after thing and so <laughs> anyhow I'll worry about that later <laughs> how's it been Andrew. <laughs> It's been <laughs> after. You know the show's over when Andrew's just in his settings. <laughs> cursing <laughs> Apple. I'm frustrated. I'm I frustrated. know. We're aware. <laughs> All right. Bye. <laughs> All right. All right. I'm going to shut off the stream. Yeah. Thank you guys for hanging out. We love you. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>